Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to talk about uh, happiness. And as you see, the title is The Evidence-Based Pursuit of Happiness. I will look at happiness in the way we look at health. And we have evidence-based pursuit of health. And, well, we do that for quite a while. And as a result, we are now healthier uh, than ever before in human history. And a healthy life expectancy is very high. And what I want to show is that we can do a similar thing with happiness. Oop. Yeah. Um, then I will first uh, consider why we pursue happiness at all. Um, then, in short, whether we can know happiness in the same way as we can uh, know health. Yeah, so can we define it, can we measure it, and can we identify its causes? And then I go on of what we know about happiness. And first, what we should know for the evidence-based pursuit of happiness. Then what we do know at the moment, well, and it will appear that we know a lot, but not enough. And then I end with, with what we can get to know and that's also, well, part of the research program for OpenTIA. So let's first go to why we pursue happiness at all. Oops, ah. um, then I will start with some kind of history. Um, for some time in, in uh, at least human uh, uh, um, European history, the idea was that happiness is not possible and even if you could have it, it was not desirable. Uh, and happiness, well, that was something of divine luck or not, uh, predestination uh, for um, uh, some of the um, uh, uh, Protestants. And then actually the Enlightenment and intellectual movement uh, in the uh, end of the 17th century said, yes, happiness is possible. And what they said, it's not just something uh, we experience in afterlife and um, we can be happy uh, in this life. And they also did agree, disagree with the religious view that we are here on earth to suffer. And if we have suffered enough, then maybe we are admitted uh, to heaven. No was the enlightened view, <laughs> and even in, uh, that, that's not God's idea that we should suffer. Um, we could be happy here. And not only that, uh, they said, well, happiness is possible, um, but he also said happiness is desirable. Um, and from this idea developed, uh, well, say a moral theory, uh, that the good and bad of things is actually in its consequences. Uh, that is different from the principled approach. And the principled approach is they, they say, well, some things are good or bad. Eh? Stealing is bad. Well, why is that? Well, because it's in the Ten Commandments. And eh? so there's a principle eh, in, in the final elevation, and that's the basis of morality. In the Enlightenment, they it shifted to another uh, basis of morality. They said things are good or, or bad if they are good in their consequences. And stealing is bad uh, because it ruins the economy. And then, well, what is then the final consequence that is untypically uh, um, happiness? So things are bad if they harm the happiness of most people. And that is um, uh, called utilitarianism in the language of philosophers. And also a fruit of enlightened thought is that happiness is, well, not a stroke or luck or um, of divine predestination. Um, it is achievable and it's achievable using our brain and not just our uh, common brain, but also the systematic brain, uh, which is science. 
And so the, in the Enlightenment, the idea came that we can make happiness and we can make a better society, we can make a better life. Um, yes, that was uh, a common idea in the, uh, say, the 17th and the 18th century, but that idea disappeared. And you see it if you, you, you read the philosophy books, and there was a lot of happiness in the beginning, and then it disappeared. And when I took a class in social philosophy in the 1960s, um, uh, happiness was in the history section. <laughs> <laughs> and, and why was that? Well, that was partly because of opposition. And you can imagine that the church wasn't amused about these enlightened views. And because the church, the product was the principled uh, morality. And at least uh, most of the churches at that time uh, still saw that we were here to suffer in order to uh, get in heaven. So the church was opposed. And they were in the 19th century still very prominent. In the 19th century, the intellectual uh, um, debate was also um, there were the liberals uh, uh, quite strong and later in the 19th century the socialists and these are also children of the enlightenment but they were they had mixed feelings about happiness and why was that because the liberals were fighting for freedom for voting rights and they thought it was kind of risky to say, well, we should go for the greatest happiness of the greatest number. And because the aristocracy and the kings at the time who were still in power, uh, they could say, well, uh, greater happiness, uh, we've done that for centuries, and we don't need voting rights for that. And so liberals preferred freedom rather than happiness. They were not against happiness, but freedom was a priority. And for the socialists in the, the end of the 19th century, it was equality. And then in the beginning of the 20th century, and with the world wars, then we had nationalists. And nationalists were not interested in uh, happiness. Uh, they were interested in national glory. And you should be prepared to, to die for that. Uh, so, and that's one reason to say that is the intellectual opposition another reason is that there were more urgent problems in the 19th century and it was still uh, wars epidemics and there was a, a lot of political repression and there was also little knowledge about happiness and people couldn't even define the concept okay but uh, things have changed because the opposition has declined and the church lost most power, the liberals got a deal, the socialists got a deal, and the nationalists killed each other. <laughs> and so a lot of the opposition was removed, and a lot of the urgent problems were solved. And we don't have many epidemics any, any, anymore. And the AIDS epidemic was the last. Uh, we live in a time of peace. And, uh, well, there's still repression, but in most countries we have fairly functioning democracy. And by now we know far more about happiness than we did in the 19th century. And so there's a resurrection of the idea, and that reflects in uh, much more scientific publications. And there's an enormous rise in scientific interest, and actually, well, our gathering here is part of that trend. Okay, so um, uh, happiness is back on the agenda. Happiness is also back on the scientific agenda. Um, but is that correct? Can we really know and study happiness like we can study health? Well, then one question is, can we define it? Can we measure it? 
and can we identify the causes of happiness? If not, we should stop here. <laughs> um, first, can we define happiness? Well, the problem uh, with the, 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 the concept of happiness is that it's, it belongs to uh, notions of the good life, of quality of life. And if you think about qualities of life, quality of life, then actually there's not one quality of life, but there are more qualities of life. There are qualities in your environment, and there are qualities in yourself, and there are chances for a good life, and there are outcomes of life, which gives the following four qualities of life, which have all been called happiness. So the chances for a good life, which are in your environment, that is the livability of your environment. The chances for a good life in yourself, that is your life ability. And so um, you can live, uh, have a good livability, for instance you live in paradise, uh, but you are very neurotic, yeah, low, <laughs> then still <laughs> it's no great life. And on the other hand, we know that there are people in, in very difficult positions, eh? for instance in concentration camps, which are so strong eh, that they, even in these dire conditions, could maintain. But this is chances for a good life, which is not the same as outcomes. And if you judge your life um, on the outcomes, then you can judge what the quality of your life is in its contribution to the environment, which is the usefulness of your life. And for academics, that is typically writing a lot of books, articles, <laughs> and the higher the pile, the greater the usefulness. <laughs> Well, now you understand that it's not the same as satisfaction. <laughs> eh, that is uh, how much, eh, that is uh, uh, the, uh, the results of life uh, uh, for yourself. Well, when I speak about happiness, I speak about happiness in the sense of satisfaction. But satisfaction is again one word with several meanings. Uh, there is passing satisfaction, there is enduring satisfaction, the satisfaction with part of life and satisfaction with life as a whole. And this results in four kinds of satisfaction, which again have all been called happiness. Um, a passing partial satisfaction of life, that's what we call a, a pleasure, eh, which can be sensoric, eh, a good meal uh, or intellectual, a good book, but it's passing. Um, uh, an enduring uh, set, um, uh, um, partial uh, uh, satisfaction with a part of life, that is um, uh, satisfaction with your country, with your marriage, uh, or with your work. Now I was talking about academics uh, writing high piles of books and articles. And typically these academics uh, um, are, are very satisfied with their work. Uh, often they are so satisfied that they work all the time. <laughs> and uh, not seldom their wife leaves them <laughs> and that it takes days before they notice. Uh, <laughs> well, that helps you see that um, job satisfaction is not the same as life satisfaction. Uh, and and life satisfaction, so that satisfaction with the whole of life, so your work and your marriage and your country. And life satisfaction can be experienced in passing, and when you have an ecstatic experience. Um, but it is not the same as life satisfaction. Actually, people who have easy have ecstatic experiences are not the ones who are most satisfied with their life as a whole. And probably if you don't like life so much, 
you're more open for, for that one moment of a peak and even ready to have a little pill to um, get it. Anyway, when I talk about happiness, I talk about happiness in the sense of life satisfaction. And if we go back to, well, the father of enlightenment, uh, happiness enlightenment, Jeremy Bentham, uh, he defined happiness as the sum of pleasures and pains. And that is actually what we today call life satisfaction. Okay, so we can define it. Eh, amongst the, these merits of meanings, we can identify one. Can we measure that? Well, the ideal of measurement is a scientist in um, a white gown and uh, a pencil um, doing objective observation. Ah, can we measure happiness in that way? If I know your life situation, your house, your bank account, or should I take uh, blood tests or uh, secretly observe your behavior and what psychologists like to do uh, behind a one-way screen. Yeah, that's all objective and it sounds very scientific. Um, but you know, you can also use questions and you can do that in indirectly um, as uh, psychologists like to do. Um, or you can even do it directly. How much do you like your life? Well, to make a long story short, this is not a way to measure happiness. Because if I assess your life situation, I'm assessing the, your livability. And that's not what I want to know. I want to know how satisfied you are. And actually, I want to know which life <coughs> situations produce the greatest happiness. So that's not the way to go. In physiology, well, blood samples won't help. Using blood samples, we can assess stress, um, but not happiness. Uh, if we do brain scans, well, we can see um, whether you feel good at the moment, um, but not how much you like your life as a whole, unless you're in the brain scanner all your life. Uh, uh, can a trained psychologist see how happy you are? Well, if you're deeply depressed, and even normal people can see that. Um, but if you are a bit unhappy, um, you can hardly see that in, in, in the behavior. So this doesn't work. And why should you use observation at all? By definition, happiness is something that's on our mind. And things that are on people's minds, well, you can simply measure that. Questioning. Well, then the psychologists typically use it, do it indirectly. Uh, you often sing under the shower. Um, uh, do you think it's mostly beautiful weather? And a list like that. Uh, you can do it this way, but it's far more simple <laughs> to ask directly. How do you like your life? And this is such a question, taking all together, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? Well, if you're very dissatisfied, you say one. If you're very satisfied, you say ten. Very simple question. Uh, and it's so simple that everybody understands. Uh, and this question has, well, been answered um, by several millions of people by now. And later we, I show the results. Well, um, now we can define happiness, we can measure it, and can we uh, um, identify its causes? Yes. Like in the case of health, we can compare happy and unhappy people. Uh, we compare over time. Uh, do people become happier, for instance, when they have an, uh, uh, an education? And we can do experiments. Um, 
in the case of happiness, typically natural experiments. Um, but in principle, we can do it in the same way. And so we can profit eh, from the experience uh, we have in the health sciences. Okay, well, you've seen the graph. And there's already uh, quite some scientific production uh, on happiness. And uh, what did that learn? Now, here is how I organize the, the rest of this um, uh, lecture. In order to um, uh, chart the, um, uh, the knowledge, you f we should first consider what should we know. And only when you know what we should know, you can judge what we do know. And what we still <coughs> get to know. And I do that at three levels. Hey, what should, do and can we get to know at a personal level. And for us personally to get happier. And the same at organizations. And what should we know in order to create greater happiness in uh, workshops, in universities. And also what should we know as a government eh, to create greater happiness of a greater number of citizens. Okay, let me, eh, so I will now expand on each of these. What should we know? Um, if you personally want to become happier, uh, then the first thing to know is, yeah, well, how happy are you? <laughs> Um, and only if you know how happy you are, you can uh, assess the chance to um, uh, get happier. And for instance, if you uh, um, say, well, I want to be healthier, yeah, but if you are the healthiest person in the world, and then there's little chance that you get healthier. Uh, but if, if your uh, health is mediocre, yes, well, then there is a chance to uh, get happier. Okay, if you can be happier, and then the question is what to do. And what to do is typically what to choose. And because we, we don't sit down and say, well, I want to get happier, what should I do now? But in life you're confronted with choices, eh, which, uh, uh, which um, a person uh, uh, to start a love relationship with, uh, what profession, eh, where to live, eh, Actually, you, your happiness is made in a series of choices. And, yeah, well, happiness is not the only thing in life. And you also want uh, to know how a happiness will fit your further aims. And we, most of us, also want to be responsible citizens and uh, do something good for the world, even if it wouldn't make us happy. Okay, that's what we should know. And now again I expand. <laughs> so here the questions here, um, uh, is greater happiness possible? What can, can you do about it? What to choose? Fit with further goals? And then for persons, for you, for organizations, uh, if, 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 if you're in the management, and for government, if you're a politician. And these are the questions to be answered. And what I will do in this lecture is, well, show what knowledge in each of these rectangles is. And especially where the blank spots are. And so, is greater happiness possible? Well, first, how happy are you and how, f how far from the possible? And, well, if it's, if you can get happier, then, yeah, are you dismissive of your own happiness? Or, well, if it's in your genes, yeah, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if it's a matter of luck, yeah, you can do not much either, huh? but how much is it the matter of choice? And how much is it the matter of right choices? 
And if so, what to choose? Yeah, I seek what conditions? Yeah, in, in what country should you live? Uh, and what profession? And uh, how develop? Yeah, and this is the livability part, yeah, but this is the life ability part, yeah, which you can develop. And yeah, what you sh should you do and which track in life should you follow? Well, if you know that, then the question is, well, will that fit other goals? And for instance, if you say, well, I can get happier if I make a career. Okay, uh, how will that work out on, um, on other people and on the economy? And suppose you get happier. Will that make you a nicer person? These are the questions. What we should know. And for the moment it is all blank. Okay, then I go to what we do know. And so in, in which of these uh, rectangles uh, is some information. And then where do I get the information from? Well, this is my love baby. This is the World Database of Happiness. And what I do is, I'll first tell you a bit about that. And then I use that source and see what we do know about happiness for persons, organizations and governments. But first a few words about the World Database of Happiness. Here it is, and the World Database of Happiness is uh, on the web. And it is a findings archive. It's a, a different archives in, in, in sciences. And we have bibliographies, and which uh, store uh, publications. And we have data banks, and which uh, store raw data. But this is another kind. This stores findings. And for instance, uh, in uh, 98, uh, 88, um, average happiness in South Africa was such. And the correlation between happiness and income was such. Uh, um, and this is the structure of the collections. Um, I start um, taking the world literature on subjective well-being. From that I select studies that fit the definition of happiness I just explained. You see that um, uh, is much less. From that pool I select uh, the studies that used an acceptable measure of happiness. Then I have about a quarter of what I started with. And from that pool of um, research reports on happiness and using acceptable indicators, uh, then I extract the findings, the first distributional findings, how happy are people in a particular place and time. I do that for nations, but also uh, for publics in nations, uh, for instance for elderly people uh, or for young children. That is distributional findings and well we have um, about 5,000 of these. And there's also correlational findings, uh, what goes together uh, with greater happiness. Yeah. For instance, what's the relation between income and happiness? Yeah. Are men uh, happier than women? Um, and there are about 50,000, 15,000 of these correlational findings. And well, that is a reflection of that graph you saw yeah, of the growing number of publications. And here's an example of um, data from South Africa. And here you see that average happiness in South Africa is uh, 5.8 on scale 0 to 10. Um, 
Well, which is uh, lower than the champion, uh, 8.5 Costa Rica, uh, but much higher than uh, the lowest, uh, 2.6 in Togo. Actually, uh, what um, uh, happens uh, is about um, South Africa is in the middle. And, uh, well, this is average happiness. You can also compute happy life years if you combine happiness with longevity. And just as, as you have healthy life years, you can compute uh, happy life years. And uh, then, uh, well, South Africa is also uh, in the middle. And here you see average happiness in South Africa over time. And this was uh, 1980. And then it dropped a bit, and the last, but the last is 2007, and these data always lag behind a bit, and then it was better. This is the uh, um, distributional findings in South Africa, and as I said, there's also correlational findings, and uh, these correlational findings are sorted by subject. I have here um, a subject happiness and possessions and then you see uh, well uh, on total wealth uh, there are uh, 12 studies uh, that measure all that people have and uh, their savings uh, their house but there's also studies on uh, the difference between uh, uh, having a car or not and uh, having internet at home or have savings. Well, I, I choose this one because it's so short <laughs> that it uh, fits uh, the screen. Uh, on many other things, uh, for instance, family, there is so much uh, more diversity that it wouldn't fit. But it's just to give you an intention what's in the World Database of Happiness. Now, to make a long story short, you get here an overview of what I found on information in this World Database of Happiness in answer to these questions. And the darker the field, the more we know. And if we were completely informed, this would be entirely black. Well, you don't see any black at all. <laughs> um, so there's still a lot to know. Um, but we know fairly well how happy we are and how far we are from the possible, personally, but in organizations we hardly know how happy people are in organizations. At best we know something about the job satisfaction, but not the life satisfaction. And we don't know how happy people, for instance, could be in a university. Uh, at the national level, we are much better informed. I will show you later. Uh, and, uh, well, we can also um, see pretty good how far South Africa is from uh, what is possible. Uh, then, okay, huh, um, we, we know this. Well, the answer is we can get happier. At least most people can get happier than they are. And we know fairly well how much that is in genes. Typically in advanced societies, some um, 30%. And we also know that part is in good or bad luck. Uh, even in well-organized societies, about 15% of the differences in happiness is things that happens to you. Your house burns down, uh, uh, the company uh, gets broke. And we have a pretty good view on how much it is in things we can choose. But the matter of genes, we hardly know that at the nation level. Um, but we know fairly well what governments should choose to create greater happiness for a greater number. And you see here, and this, uh, what to, ch to choose. Actually, we have better information on what governments should do than what we as a person should do. That is because among persons there's more diversity than among societies. 
And in the last question, how well does um, the means to happiness fit other goals? Um, yes, for instance, uh, we, we, we know that if you want to get happier and then, well, have good relationships and support other people, which is desirable from another point of view as well. And so we know quite something here. And we also know that happiness, uh, if you get happier, that it typically has consequences which we deem good. Uh, just like healthy people function better, better at work and also better in social relationships. The same is true for happy people. Still, it's not entirely black. And we have a, a few effects, but not all you can think of. So this is the global picture. And here you already see that this is where um, uh, the blank spots are. <coughs> what I will do now is focus even further, not on all these quadrants, but just a few to give you a flavor of uh, what we uh, should get to know and what we do know now and should get to know later. And then I focus first on what persons should know. Now, I told you first we should know how happy am I, could I be happier, what to choose and how well does that fit. Well, how happy are we? Well, most people, uh, you've seen the question, you can answer that for yourself. Huh? Are you uh, a six, a seven, an eight? That's not the problem. The problem is, could you be happier? Well, how can you know? Um, there is one tool um, uh, that helps to do that. Uh, this is the happiness indicator, uh, which is a project at uh, Erasmus University uh, developed together with um, a large health insurance company. And the, you can compare your happiness. First you fill in how happy you are, how happy do you feel today, and how happy did you feel last month. Well, you enter that on the net, whoop, and then the program compares with other people. So um, uh, this was me, I had a very nice day, ah, and it was much better than other people. <laughs> But, compared to people like me, same age, education, family situation, uh, the difference is not too big. And here is how happy did you feel in the last month. Well, in the last month I didn't feel as happy as I felt on that day, it was an 8. And again, that seemed to be much more than average person but not much different from people like me. But the message for me is, you may be at your maximum. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if it were reversed, hey, I, I scored seven and people like me eight, well, then it would be a sign, okay, and uh, some gain is possible. Too bad for me, but I don't complain. And then, if you um, uh, want to get happier, then the question is what to choose. And here I have two examples. Um, and one example in the realm of family and one in the realm of consumption. <coughs> and in the realm of family, I have another chart. Here are the questions. And well, in my family life, should I um, uh, live alone or together? Uh, if you live together, then there's also the question, should I have affairs? <laughs> and still another question is, should I tell my wife? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do, there's a chance of divorce. <laughs> How bad is that? Uh, and remarriage. And it is all things that most people have to choose. 
And, well, what does science tell about that? Well, in science we can have, uh, um, um, we can tell you what um, happens to the average person. What happens to the average person when they start living together? Well, at first view, and the raw correlation is that they get much happier. And because married and single people, uh, um, well, there's uh, quite a difference, and uh, which you see uh, almost everywhere. But that's partly selective, and because um, uh, people who marry, most of them, we're already happier, and because that's improved the chances on the marriage market. They tend to be healthier. Often they also have more money. And if you rule that out, you can have a partial correlation, then still it's a good idea to, to marry, um, but it's, uh, the gains are smaller. Then still you're not sure that marriage really makes you happier, uh, because um, there they, they can be uh, all kinds of confounding factors. And the real test of the pudding is that you know how happy a person is. You're single, married, and married somewhat longer. And then does marriage still add to happiness? And then we go to the follow-up studies. And indeed, in the case of uh, um, uh, marriage, at least on the average, you see that um, uh, uh, people get happier. But note that the data are less abundant here, and so it's um, uh, a lighter color. But we have some 10 follow-up studies which show that. Then, okay, if the average person, huh, we are talking about the average person, gets happier when married, you're not the average person you're pretty unique. So what you would like to know, how does marriage work out for people like me? And then what you would like to know is how um, it works out for a specific type of people. And then for instance the question is, um, if you're a difficult person, uh, a bit neurotic, um, is it then still wise to marry? Um, well, we have not much evidence on that, uh, but this should be a very tiny plus. <laughs> um, even difficult people get a bit happier when they marry. We don't have data on their partners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but easy people get much uh, happier. And, uh, but this is still under research. Well, in the case of having an affair, there's only um, uh, uh, one or two uh, raw studies that, well, people who do have affairs are slightly happier, uh, but we don't know how it is in the follow-up. <laughs> and uh, mostly <laughs> things go wrong. And affairs often end up in a divorce. And how bad is that? Well. Clearly, uh, divorcees are less happy than people are, who are still married. And even if you partial out uh, a lot of things, such as the health, they're still less happy. But if you use the follow-up, then you see that at least some people, in the end, get happier. Typically, if they remarry and others not. And so they are, in, in, in the long term, they are typically winners and losers. And for that reason, you would like to know how things pan out for people like you. And again, here data falls short. And yeah, one of the technical reasons is that our samples are typically too small to make good specifications. And for that reason, well, we have nice scientific results but not very useful for the consumer. This is what the consumer would like to know, but this is what science doesn't yet give. Well, and then uh, uh, if you have a marriage, then there's a next choice, having children. Well, 
how would that work out on uh, your happiness? If you take the simple data, then you see that people uh, with children are happier than people without. But people with children are typically married, and part of the effect is in marriage. And if you take that out, you see a more diverse picture. And if you go in the follow-up, uh, you see that on average, uh, happiness goes down. At first, um, in the pregnancy, and uh, in the, the first months, happiness is high, and then, oops, and then, until the child leaves home. <laughs> but, there are wide differences. Uh, some people really get much happier, and there are also people who get much less happy, uh, even depressed. So, it, 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 this finding is not enough. And what you want to know is how it works out on particular types of people. And then one bad message is that it works out negatively on highly educated women. Um, but another message, uh, which is uh, more comforting maybe, uh, is that it works out better if you have children late. Okay, that's not everything. Hey? You would also know how it works out for personality and things like that. But uh, actually, we already have a bit of data on personality. Um, together with a student, I did in, uh, an analysis. And um, the answer is that easy people, they, uh, they do best when they have children. And when, when you're tolerant, not even that you tolerate uh, your children, but also that you tolerate your spouse. <laughs> These people are the winners in, uh, when it comes to parenthood. Well, and in the case of how many, there, there are no, not yet consistent results. Whatever method you use, you have small differences. Ah, but this is just an example of a fairly well-researched area where we already have uh, well relevant information, though uh, we are lacking on specific types. Now we give you an example of an, an another realm of choice on which we are less well informed, and that is on consumption. And we work to get money, and there's a lot of research on um, the relationship between earnings and happiness, but strangely enough, there's hardly any research on spending and happiness. And why do you earn happiness? Do you earn income in order to spend it? Well, uh, one question is spend how much? And then there's one sp study on low uh, uh, spenders, uh, which is often cited in the sustainability literature, but it's a very bad study. Uh, it's only a cross-section and probably uh, a lot of students there uh, who are happy for other reasons than their low spending. <laughs> and there's no partial, there's no follow-up. Uh, but what we do see, and that is um, better information, is that people who have savings, um, so they earn but they don't spend too much, uh, that these tend to be happier. But again, no follow-up. There's also very meager information on spending on what. At first sight, people who have a car are happier, but if you partial out uh, um, uh, their income and a lot of things, then it disappears. A house is better, eh? more consistent, positively related, but we don't have follow-up and we don't know what kind of people profit most from having a house yeah, or rather rent. Well, luxury, okay, yeah, uh, positive relationship, but rich people can afford more luxury, and so we don't really know where it is. Is it in their earning capacity or in that they spend it on big cars? And f food, yes, the more people spend on food, uh, uh, and on outdoor uh, activities, they tend to be happier, um, but that's also hardly a surprise. 
the best information we have as yet is on holidays. And indeed, people who um, uh, go on holidays tend to be happier than people who do not, even if you parcel out their income. But it could be that happier people are more inclined to go on holidays and are on the holiday if, equally happy as they were before. <laughs> And actually, in the, the few follow-up studies we have show that, well, when people go on holiday, they are slightly happier during the holiday, and when they are back home, they are just as happy as they began. And we don't know what kind of people profit most from a holiday and from what holiday. And I think this, this is, a, is a real default of the travel business. And they, they are interested in selling travel and they spend uh, lots of money in finding out what kind of people will buy a kind of holiday, but they're not really interested in where that adds to the happiness of their clients. Okay, and how well does that fit uh, my further aims? Um, well, especially in the case of consumption, that is, uh, and so suppose that you are the kind of person uh, who gets happier from having uh, two houses and three cars, but if you also uh, mind the environment, then there's a problem. But that the answer to that question differs uh, uh, across persons, so I skip that. Uh, then, well, this was an illustration of this column. Well, in the case of organizations, we know very little. We do know that, uh, we, we don't know how happy people are in organizations. And you could say, well, in a, a factory, uh, the factory is not interested in the happiness of its uh, personal uh, happiness. The factory is interested in production and gains. Okay, uh, for the factory, uh, but how about universities? Are we only here to um, pump knowledge in our students? Or is there also, um, should we also um, help them to lead a happy life? And even more, some organizations are actually, their product is happiness. And for instance, care homes. Typically, hey, even care homes don't know how happy their people are. Typically, they know how long they live. And, um, and so this is blank. Uh, we hardly know how much uh, happiness in organization is a matter of selection. And some organizations might hire happier people than others. And then they score high on job satisfaction, while possibly the quality of their work environment is not very good. There is some literature um, suggesting that um, autonomy in organizations adds to happiness, but we don't really know uh, adds to happiness of what kind of people. Well, so this is pretty empty, there's a lot of work to do here. So let me now go to the uh, uh, government, <coughs> that is this column. And what governments should know is, first of all, how happy are our people. Well, in the case of South Africa, they can know. And because it is the, well, the, the uh, life satisfaction as assessed with the question I showed you. And then you see that, uh, well, it's not too bad, it's uh, uh, about uh, seven, um, 16, 18% uh, of the South Africans score 10, which is pretty good, and they're nines and eights. But there's also a considerable part of the population not very happy, uh, and about 4% scoring one, well, which is uh, pretty bad. Uh, but here we do have a picture of uh, how happy uh, people are. And we also have data of South Africa over time. 
and it's the picture I showed you earlier and you see that it improves a bit and now we can also answer the question could happiness be higher in South Africa well here you see the world map of happiness and then the darker the color the happier the people are so here is uh, uh, Denmark uh, uh, 8.3 and somewhere here is the world champion 8.5 um, and well here's Africa and you see that Africa isn't the happiest continent and we were talking about uh, uh, Zimbabwe <laughs> and uh, well they're really not too happy <laughs> um, and then we're talking about the Zimbabweans who are still in Zimbabwe <laughs> and uh, a lot of them uh, uh, have left the country and then you see that um, um, in the um, African context, uh, South Africa is doing very well. But if you look across the ocean, uh, you'll see Latin America uh, in, in some respects uh, pretty comparable uh, uh, with South Africa, but much happier. And then some people say, well, but it is in the, in, in the, in the genes of these people. And which could be the case. And indeed, there are slight indications that even at the population level, there, there is some genetic influence. But this, this is not really a fixed thing. And you see that here. And for instance, in the case of Russia. And you know the Russians have the reputation of being very unhappy and drunk all the time for that reason. Uh, and indeed, the, the data show that the Russians, uh, the, the, the first survey was uh, after the regime change, that they are not too happy, uh, an average of five. But you see that even in Russia, it could be worse. Here is the ruble crisis. And when, uh, well, about a quarter of the population lost their income. But the Russians are not doomed to be unhappy eh, by their culture or genes because in a pretty short time they got much happier. And this is one of the reasons why Putin was re-elected. Things really changed a lot to the better in, 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 in Russia. And, well, if you see these enormous changes, eh, if you compare this to health, it's even even more uh, changeable huh, than, than, for instance, life expectancy, um, then clearly happiness can change. And another example is, well, actually the world champion, if we leave out um, uh, that one time uh, survey in uh, Costa Rica, Denmark, and the Danes were already pretty happy in, uh, uh, in 1965, but gradually they have become happier so even at the top of the happiness distribution in the present day world improvement is possible i don't think that an average of nine is possible uh, but if, if we if we say well that the, the maximum possible in a country is 8.5 well then there's still a long way to go I compare it with longevity. Yeah, and we, we've seen uh, that some countries like, uh, like Japan uh, can realize um, a pretty long life. I think the average is now uh, uh, 79 or so. Well, what's possible in Japan it should also be possible in, uh, in South Africa. And in the same way, uh, if such a high level is possible in, in Denmark, then it should also be possible in uh, South Africa. Well, how can that be achieved? And in the case of happiness in nations, we are pretty well informed. We do know that um, uh, a lot depends on wealth. The wealthier the country, the happier people are. And that's no, not only in uh, uh, the raw correlation, uh, but it's also if you think aloud um, a lot of factors uh, such as the age uh, constitution of the country and things like that 
and the level of democracy, then you still see that rich countries are happier. And interestingly, if you follow over time, then it appears that in the countries that get richer, they also get happier. This is contrary to the so-called Easterlin paradox in economy. Richard Easterlin uh, saying that um, rise in income doesn't, isn't followed by a rise in happiness. And he's wrong. The data he read in the 1980s indeed supported that view, but now we have more data. Uh, I showed you in the World Database of Happiness, we have now uh, 5,000 uh, uh, observations of average happiness in nations. And using these data, we can show that in indeed the effect is small, in particularly in rich nations, but there is a correlation between economic growth and happiness. We also know that freedom adds to happiness, uh, economic freedom, and even if you parcel out a lot of things, then it still works. And we also know that economic freedom is particularly conducive to happiness in poor nations. Whereas political freedom is, most, um, is also highly correlated independently of economic freedom, but political freedom is more conducive to happiness in rich nations. And interestingly, um, there's also data about equality, and there's much data about equality in income. I know that income inequality is a great issue in, uh, in South Africa, and, well, there are good reasons to pursue greater inequality, because it's fair, but it doesn't add to happiness. Not, um, not in the, uh, uh, the, the raw analysis, not in the partial analysis, and also a recent finding, not if you compare over time. And why is that? Well, of course, great income inequality has negative effects. Eh? It's not nice to be poor and to see other people and, and drive luxury cars. But there are also good effects in uh, uh, income inequality, eh, which more or less fit the economic freedom. And the neoliberalists also have a point. And it seems that the, the wisdom of the neoliberalists equals the wisdom of the egalitarians, and the result is a zero relationship. That's equality in income. But uh, equality um, of males and females is another story that is clearly positively related to happiness in all countries. Uh, but this shows that not everything we deem fair, income inequality, is related to happiness. And uh, like not all, all the things we like to eat is good for our health. Okay, um, uh, and then the last question is, okay, if we know uh, um, what makes us happier, and uh, for instance, more wealth and, uh, 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 and freedom, how does that fit the wider policy mix? Well, in the policy mix of South Africa, uh, where appeasement is a major thing, you could still decide to go for and greater income inequality, even if it doesn't materialize in greater happiness. And in this case, it doesn't hurt happiness either. Uh, but that is what each, each country in its policy context uh, should decide. And so, and, and so here we are pretty, well, we have some information. We have not full information, but we have some. Okay, and then lastly, um, what can we get to know? Well, all the white spots are here, <laughs> uh, but uh, we should focus on organizations in the first place. And when it comes to methods, yeah, we have a lot of raw, 
correlations, and which you have seen in my examples. There's also much partial things, and especially economists are very good in that, and they partial out everything, sometimes too much. But there is a lack of follow-up studies, and there is, there is a, an even greater lack of specifications. And so in our methodology, and we should focus here, rather than add on the heap of things we already know. In conclusion, greater happiness is possible, certainly in South Africa, and we know fairly well who, how that can be achieved, um, but there are still many blank spots, in particular at the level of organizations, and I think that's one of the things OpenTIA can do. Thank you for the attention. Oh yeah, and my last thing, um, there's a paper which is on the website. Dear professors, ladies and gentlemen, in closing, let me say, on the internet and in bookstores, a thousand views tout different philosophical speculative remedies for human misery and how to pursue happiness. But fortunately tonight, a guru in his own right, Profian Ogun, often called the happiness professor, undoubtedly convinced us that the greatest guru to consult is the scientific world. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and research of happiness with us tonight. South Africa as a developing country can only go from strength to strength when we as a nation have a subjective appreciation of life, caring for the well-being and quality of life of every South African. Miriam Akhtar postulated in the World Book of Happiness that happiness is, the, is like a muscle that can be developed. And when you put your focus on it, it grows. Potentia is this muscle. And in collaboration with important role players such as the extra prof extraordinary professors that we have, this muscle is developed and making it grow. With the knowledge we gained here tonight, may we all be as happy as we can be. And may Optensia also try to make South Africa happy. I thank you.